in my room where we advocated for a more inclusive kind of multilateralism at the UN. Notably, we called for the creation of a new status for local and regional governments to get accredited and be able to participate in the assembly in their own capacity. So the objective of today's event is for speakers um, to provide their first hand, to provide you, sorry, with their, with their first hand experience. Um, of the second Habitat Assembly, which gathered more than 3,000 people in person in Nairobi, 2,000 online, and more than 80, I think, person at the ministerial level. So it was quite a big gathering. So as you may know, the Assembly is the governance body of UN Habitat, and decisions are taken by member states, like in any other UN forum. But many stakeholders participate in the assembly, including local and regional governments, given that so many actually of the topics discussed there are very much relevant to uh, local and regional governments. So we hope this Geneva Urban Debate today will enable you to get a good overview of what happened there, what are the outcome, in particular, what are the outcomes that are relevant for local and regional governments. So I'm now turning to my first speaker and friend, Graham Alabaster. You are the chief of the um, UN Habitat Office in Geneva, mm -hmm. and you, of course you were in Nairobi Absolutely. last week. So please explain to us what is the Assembly, what is its role, and why is it so le relevant for local and regional governments? Okay, and um, just a little bit of potted history about UN Habitat. I mean, we were formed in 1978 as a result of the first Human Settlements Conference in, in Vancouver, Canada. But um, we were then a centre for human settlements. Um, we went on to become, um, in 2001, a fully fledged programme of the UN, the United Nations Centre for Human Settlements. Um, and uh, uh, when we were a fully fledged programme, we were managed by a governing council. But in December 2018, uh, by a General Assembly resolution, um, the government system was changed and uh, we were granted uh, to have uh, the assembly, uh, the UN Habitat Assembly, as our main decision-making body. And that um, decision-making body uh, has, of course, subsidiary bodies, uh, has a, an executive committee and other groups. But the main responsibilities of that body are to, you know, um, identify the key issues um, and focus areas for normative and policy work of UN Habitat, to look at major sort of trends in urbanization and human settlements, um, to look at global norms and standards, but of course to uh, additionally uh, adopt resolutions, um, declarations, recommendations, um, and to recommend uh, strategies for the coherent implementation of, uh, of work of, on uh, urban and human settlements uh, in line with the 2030 agenda and the new urban agenda, which was agreed in, in Quito just a few years ago. And how, of course, that work uh, re relates to um, other work on urban settlements in, um, in the UN system. So um, we are, as many of you know, um, one of the uh, only agencies who works uh, directly with local authorities and regional governments. Of course, we work with, with national ministries, but we have a special focus on cities and city management structures. And um, Although uh, we don't actually have them represented, as Antu said, on our, um, our assembly yet, many of the subsidiary bodies and uh, groups that contribute to the work of the assembly uh, are well represented by members of um, local and regional governments and other different groups. So really, um, the assembly uh, is uh, the, the, uh, the decision-making power of the assembly is, 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 is helped a lot and advised on by these groups, of course, which local um, authorities and regional governments are an important part. Thank you so much for this, uh, I think, very useful, you know, um, recall about what is um, the Assembly, what is UN's Habitat's original mandate. What were the main institutional outcomes of the Assembly? Well, I mean, I think that the, the most, perhaps the most important thing is that the, the, the mandate of UN Habitat uh, has become even more important because as we speak, 
you know, by 2030, we're going to find 3 million people, about 40% of the world's population, who will be living in inadequate housing. Um, you know, for those who are subject to conflicts and environmental disasters, 60% um, of those populations are going to seek refuge in urban settings. And of course, uh, climate uh, emissions uh, are 70% come from cities. So, so basically, um, the, the resolutions and the discussions in the assembly uh, focused around addressing those key themes. Uh, so, you know, we have, uh, as I think you're going to mention later, we mm -hmm. had the uh, resolutions on slum, uh, slum reduction and the improvements in housing. So basically, this was the most important thing. It gave, it gave focus to uh, our work uh, to make us prioritise, because of course Habitat's involved in many different things. But the, the other most important thing is that it's preparing us for uh, future sessions of the HLPF and um, the Summit of the Future, which of course is uh, Secretary General's. No thoughts. acronyms. What is the HLPF? Sorry, the, <laughs> uh, the high level uh, panel on political. Po political forum, sorry, yes. All right, excellent. Can you talk to us a little bit about the strategic plan? Uh, yes, the Habitat? certainly. Um, the strategic plan that is currently in place um, until this year, in fact, uh, has four different uh, areas. One is uh, about reducing spatial inequality. One is ensuring spare, uh, enhanced shared um, prosperity of cities. The third area is, of course, strength and climate action. And the fourth area is effective urban crisis prevention. So um, this mandate has now been, by the, by the Assembly, has now been extended up to 2025. Um, and, you know, obviously the work on housing and climate will be uh, are the main areas of our work uh, where we'll move forward. So it's very comforting for us because it shows that even when our strategic plan was developed in 2020, we were very clear that the, you know, we're very clear then about the mandates and they've become even more sharply focused now as a result of what's going on. And maybe it's important to specify that it's been extended to align yes. with other UN basically Absolutely. agencies, programs to make sure that everyone has the same planning sure. cycle. Um, one last word maybe on the ministerial declaration. Yes. That was adopted, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that the, you know, the, the, probably the most important aspect of the ministerial declaration, and perhaps the, you know, the strongest part, is the fact that, you know, the mandate's been set out, we know what's to be done, but we have to find a way to finance it. And the other way is to determine, I mean, obviously, Habitat's not a particularly large UN agency, and we work principally through partners. So, I mean, we, the, the whole idea of how that system works and how we mobilise support with our partners to deliver for the poor and those without housing and, and who are vulnerable to climate. So, so these, I think, were the main, main uh, elements for me out of the ministerial statement. The fact that this was a, a, a call to action, if you like, to fund this work. Because yes, we can have a, a wish list of what we want to do. The um, resolutions are very well articulated. But of course, without the funding, um, it's going to be difficult to do. So for me, that was the most important thing. This, re, uh, this call to action again to really to um, ensure that we have enough funds to uh, do the job. Excellent. Thanks for this overview, Graham. I think we get a flavour about what happened in Nairobi last week already. Um, I'm turning now to local and regional governments and um, turning to Barry Verbanovic, who is the mayor of the city of Kitchener in Canada. Um, which is a, a city around 250,000 people. Um, Barry Vermanovic is currently the co-president of UCLG, the United Cities and Local Governments, which is a big city network. And he wanted to be with us uh, now, but had unfortunately conflicting commitments. So we have cheated a little bit and we have recorded a short interview with him yesterday afternoon so that he may still be present somehow with us and share his perspective as a local government about what are his key takeaways from the, the assembly. So we're playing the video right now. So, Mayor, please tell us why did you take part in the Abitat Assembly and what does that bring to your city, Kitchener? Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for the question and the opportunity to uh, to join all of you as uh, as part of this follow up uh, panel 
uh, related to the uh, the recent uh, UN Habitat Assembly, the second one uh, that occurred in uh, in Nairobi. Uh, really, my involvement comes uh, twofold. I mean, first and foremost, uh, as one of the co-presidents of United Cities and Local Governments, uh, it was an opportunity to uh, represent our organization there. Um, as you know, uh, we are the, uh, the the voice of uh, the world's local governments. Uh, in uh, the United Nations and other global bodies um, and are the facilitator of the global task force of, of local and regional governments uh, convening the World Assembly that took uh, that took place uh, during the, uh, the during the assembly and so uh, obviously I played a role in that uh, speaking on some panels uh, opening the meeting and 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 so on um, but from a Kitchener perspective as well, and from a Canadian perspective, obviously Canada's been very involved, um, you know, both in uh, UN Habitat since its beginnings, uh, with its very first meeting back in uh, in Vancouver, um, but but more importantly uh, in our work uh, around the SDGs. As you know, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is the uh, uh, together with uh, Prime Minister Motley from Barbados. Um, they're both champions of the SDGs, or uh, I think uh, their official title is Advocates of the SDGs, is named by uh, Secretary General Guterres. Um, and so it really was an opportunity to see how Kitchener and the world's communities are doing in relation to implementation um, of the SDGs uh, as we hit the uh, the midpoint, the HLPF later this year, the uh, the SDG summit, and, and uh, ultimately as we look down the road towards 2030 and all all of the work that uh, that we all have to do if we're going to uh, uh, see some some additional progress going forward. Thank you so much. Um, tell me what, from your point of view, from your perspective as a local government, what were the main outcomes of the assembly? So, uh, you know, I, I would tell you there were a, a number of things, particularly from a, a municipal perspective. I mean, I think as you think about in the context of uh, national governments, obviously, um, one of the significant outcomes was uh, the adoption of the various resolutions. Uh, and I think we're going to touch on some of those, or at least the ones uh, related to the, the local government sector in particular um, later on. But as I mentioned, it was an opportunity for us to convene the uh, the World Assembly of Local and Regional Governments, which is uh, recognized within the uh, UN's new urban agenda as a follow-up mechanism to its uh, local uh, implementation. Uh, we adopted the joint statement of uh, the organized constituency of local and regional governments um, to the Habitat Assembly, uh, a statement that calls for structurally integrating uh, local governments and their networks in, in decision-making processes. Um, as well as revitalizing multilateralism from, from the bottom up. Um, as you know, we co-facilitated the, the Global Stakeholder Forum uh, Declaration, uh, which calls for a formal stakeholder policy and engagement mechanism. Um, and we called for transformative and urgent change at all orders of government by all stakeholders. Um, and it, it led to a working group on multilateralism um that uh, i think in, helped inform the deliberation of the uh, of the drafting uh, committee uh, so those are really some of the, the you know the main outcomes with some specifics uh, related to uh, a few of the uh, the resolutions uh, in particular thank you so mayor you've been involved in institute diplomacy for many years and you're currently as you said at the very beginning the co-president of uclg so what progress have you seen over the years as to the role of local governments in the work of UN Habitat? So, you know, I, I will tell you that, um, you know, having the organized constituency of UCLG as the official voice of the world's local and regional governments at the UN um, is something that has progressed significantly um, over the past decade. I've been involved uh, in about, for about 17 years now, you know, and, and I've seen how we are, are are taken much more seriously how we are brought in uh, early on in the conversation of, uh, of many issues uh, particularly the ones that that impact the local governments the most you know i remember a time when you know early on in the creation of the world assembly where you know we would meet during the hlpf but there was no space found for us in the in the united nations building we would need to rent a conference room at a nearby hotel and conduct our meeting there we've come a long way from that and we're meaningfully engaged now 
um, you know, throughout these processes. Uh, we'll be engaged in the HLPF again in July. We'll be engaged again in the um, UNGA uh, SDG summit in in, in September, um, and that, in my mind, is is critical and, and and crucial because it demonstrates, you know, by national governments that they recognize that in order to attain real meaningful progress um, on these issues, it's going to take all spheres of government rolling up their sleeves, working together to advance um, the, the fundamental issues that are critical to the sustainability of our, our planet and its people going forward. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by the progress that's, uh, that's been made. I'm encouraged by um, some of the resolutions that, uh, that were dealt with, um, you know, in particular, uh, you know, a few that related to us uh, as a as a sector in in particular, it was the, uh, the the resolution pertaining to the localization of the SDGs. There was the resolution around accelerating the transformation of uh, informal slums and settlements um, by 2030, uh, which obviously is a priority. And 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 finally, the resolution on uh, biodiverse and resilient cities um, is uh, is is important to us. Um, and, you know, really speaks to some of the work that uh, happened earlier this year uh, in the city of Montreal in Canada um, with respect to biodiversity uh, as a whole, um, in addition to past work such as the uh, COP agreement in, in Paris and, uh, and other similar documents and, and policies, including the, the new urban agenda. Thank you. Um, well, I'm thanking the mayor of Kitchener, who is not with us anymore, but of course it was really nice of him to be able to convey his position, perspectives about the outcome of the assembly. I think he referred to quite a lot of the work that was undertaken by local and regional governments, many different working groups, you know, committees. I think the main message is We've seen progress over the years in terms of their involvement in the in the work of UN Habitat. It was very informal at the very beginning, but now it's getting a little bit more organized, structured. It remains somehow informal. I mean, local and regional governments still don't have a status yet at the assembly, but they were meeting um, in the same conference room with some states participating to the meeting and therefore um, it's really, you know, thanks to their engagement and their basically commitment to say we are present, we want to localize the sustainable development goal, we want to participate to your work on urbanization and please involve us. And, and to some extent, I think they've, they've been quite successful. Let's now address um, what has been referred to several times, the resolutions um, that were adopted at the Habitat Assembly in, in a little bit more detail. So, as you may know, resolutions are put forward by states and they are negotiated by states line by line, if not word by word. So, resolutions are decisions and commitment taken by states um, on certain issues and they provide, in that case, strategic guidance over the work of UN Habitat for the next four years, even more because the, the next uh, assembly will only take place in 2029. So there were 10 resolutions, all adopted by consensus um, at the assembly, again on issues of very, I mean, they were all very much relevant to local and regional governments. And so we'll start with the first one, um, which, um, and I'm not going to go over the 10 of them, please be rest assured, but we've picked up, you know, some important resolution and we start with the, the one creating a human settlement resilience framework. And we have Esteban Leon with us. Um, Esteban, are you here with us? Yes, great. You are the head of the City Resilience Global Program at UN Habitat. And I believe you were also in Nairobi. So please tell us what this resolution is all about and how UN Habitat will implement it to serve local and regional governments. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. 
Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Um, yes, it's uh, you're you're correct. Uh, resolutions uh, have been negotiated by member states, and are and this resolution on human settlement um, on human settlement resilience framework has been very much uh, welcomed by us. Um, the resolution is basically part in two areas. One is how to um, start working on disaster risk reduction and resilience building, and the other on how to respond to crisis situations. And I, I, I say this very much welcome because it's it's some work that we have been doing as your habitat for many years now, I would say decades, um, but, uh, but, um, but has been always very much behind the scenes um, for, 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 for the rest. Uh, I mean, an agency like UN Habitat working on human settlements, of course, um, has to work uh, on human settlements in crisis as well. Um, and um, and the resolution is is uh, presenting the case of um, of having uh, a, a better mapping of uh, of uh, urban resilience actors in order to know more what is going out, is happening out there, and how, to we su how do we support better uh, cities in, in crisis situations. Um, from the one side on the uh, prevention, uh, early warning, risk reduction, and resilience building area, and from the other side, the response and response planning and contingency planning. Um, so, as I said, it's very important uh, from the point of view of um, building sustainable cities. Um, uh, but, you know, you cannot talk about building sustainable cities if uh, the cities are not uh, prepared for any kind of shock or stress. Um, so, from UN Habitat side, we have, as I said, some experience. Uh, in working in, in this area. We have been working uh, on the humanitarian response for many years now, um, always from the point of view of development uh, and, and building sustainable development, right? Um, so the response has been always building foundations for sustainable development during crisis situations. Uh, and I think that this resolution is giving us the opportunity to, as, as, as Graham said, um, to try to get some funding, uh, fundraise for that work, which is essential. I mean, and I'm I'm not saying because the resolution uh, and the request from our member states is there, but it's also because we had experience on, on this area. And we know that when you arrive to a city that has been gone through a crisis situation and it's a, under an emergency, is the right moment for us to start building foundations for their sustainability. Um, and the other part uh, is the, the part of the resilience building. Uh, I mean, we don't have to wait until we are in the middle of a disaster to start making sure that we are better prepared for that, right? Um, so the, 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 that part is essential in terms of making sure that we uh, know our city, know our risks, know our uh, actors and uh, stakeholders, make sure that we are all prepared for any contingency um, that could occur to the city. And of course, uh, the main idea is to work very closely with local authorities, local and regional authorities. It is very important to, to support them, not to cause fatigue, but especially not to, um, to duplicate the work that they are doing. Um, so yes, it's very much welcome, um, this resolution for, from, from our side. Thank you. Robert. Thank you very much, Esteban. I think it, I mean, I had one question basically before, but I think you somehow responded to that question. My question was, to what extent that provided a new mandate to UN Habitat? But I think you were very clear in saying, we've been doing this work for decades, but now you have a solid, somehow legislative basis for you to continue this work uh, on urban crisis, you know, recovery, urban crisis, resilience in general, um, and hopefully get some additional funding uh, in order to support your work. So thank you for that, Esteban. We'll move to other resolutions and see if there are questions um, online. Let me turn now to the, to, I'll, I'll go, I'll make a very, you know, a quick overview about the other resolutions. Um, another important one that was adopted was on biodiversity and resilient cities. 
and maybe just a few you know hints about what this resolution is about so it's basically encouraging requesting un habitat to encourage a shift in urbanization that really takes into account biodiversity um, and therefore for that purpose it requests un habitat to establish an open-ended international expert advisory group on biodiverse and resilient cities with I understand states, but also many other actors to produce a toolkit um, on urban development for more biodiverse and resilient cities to be ready by the end of 2024. Um, so the toolkit, as always in UN Habitat's case, aims to be pragmatic, something that can be used basically by local and regional governments to understand how, you know, what measures they have to take in order to be more biodiverse and to be more resilient, including to climate change. Um, and therefore, the toolkit will somehow compile best practices that contribute to cities being more biodiverse and more resilient. And it also aims to raise awareness about the existing standards, criteria, guidelines. So something, you know, that is available, hopefully user friendly, that really serve as, um, as, as, a, as a pragmatic tool for cities who care about their biodiversity. And also, of course, it uh, requests UN Habitat to help build capacity of, um, of countries, of local and regional governments on biodiversity management in urban planning. So just to give you, you know, a quick overview of that resolution, there are, I believe, two other important resolutions that have also been adopted. One of them is on adequate housing for all. And this resolution is directly addressed to both states and local and regional government. And the main thrust of the resolution is to establish an intergovernmental working group to make recommendation to the next habitat assembly on policies for accelerating progress towards achieving the right to housing. So it's, as you understand, a rather broad mandate, but very important one when we know that adequate housing is one of the main challenge of this century. And in doing so, the working group uh, of member state is requested to assess the state of efforts worldwide to realize the right to housing, to again identify best best practices and to propose also a framework for measuring and reporting on the adequacy of housing across diverse national and local contexts. So I think it's really a huge work. You'll have to somehow um, collaborate with other agencies. I understand the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is already kind of interested to collaborate on that. And um, in order to make that all, you know, the 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 practices, the policies that will be gathered uh, to make them accessible, UN Habitat will again create a public platform that includes the summaries of all those different policies, case studies, tools, basically, so that it again can be used by states, but also local and regional governments um, for, you know, in order to make sure that basically they provide affordable, adequate, sustainable housing for all um, in their countries, in their cities. And finally, maybe one thing that is important in this resolution is that it's calling upon international financial institution to support financing provided by states um, and local regional governments for adequate housing projects and programs. So that's that's somehow of an advocacy tool to be used by local and regional governments uh, in order to basically get access to international funding, we believe. And um, one word uh, very quickly, because it's a related resolution, there is another resolution on the, you mentioned it, the transformation of slums. This one is really directed at states, but of course it is of concern to local and regional governments. And it proposes, the resolution proposed a 10, you know, 10 action that should be taken basically to make sure that we transform slums um, in the most effective manner. And maybe one of them that I want to uh, put forward here today is that it really calls, um, it really supports multi-level multi participatory governance 
in basically transforming slums and therefore promotes, foster this famous whole of government approach and making sure that in order to transform, transform slum, uh, we have to coordinate among all spheres of government at all levels. Um, let me now turn to Pontus, who is with us. Pontus Westerberg, do you hear us? Yes, great. Hello, oh, hi, I'm here, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks for joining us. Pontus, you are the, um, the lead on people-centered smart cities at UN Habitat. And um, there is an important resolution that has been adopted as well. So I'd let you introduce the resolution and tell us how UN Habitat uh, will implement it to serve local and regional governments. You have the floor. Great, uh, thank you so much and great to, great to be here. Um, as you said, there was a, a resolution adopted last week at the, at the UN Habitat Assembly on uh, what they call international guidelines on people-centered uh, smart cities. Um, and I would say that there are, um, there are two main uh, main key points to highlight from from this resolution. Uh, the first one is that uh, the uh, the resolution uh, requests the UN Habitat Executive Director to support member states and other stakeholders, of course, including uh, local governments, in putting in place uh, what the resolution calls a uh, people centered smart cities approach um, and it starts defining what, what such a smart cities uh, approach uh, does in, in paragraph one. Um, the first one is around uh, so ensuring the equitable involvement and values of people uh, and also about, about human rights, which is a key consideration. Uh, the second one is ensuring that urban digital infrastructure um, contributes to reducing the environmental impact of cities. Uh, the third one is around capacity, uh, building the appropriate uh, capacity and, and digital skills, both within uh, national and local governments, as well as, as communities, um, digital literacy, etc. Uh, the next one is around um, appropriate multi-level digital governance. Uh, issues to do about how data is shared between different levels of government and uh, different stakeholders, uh, issues to do with interoperability of, of uh, technical systems, etc. Um, the next one is about the importance of smart cities contributing to creating um, economic opportunities. Um, and then there are two more, uh, one about uh, transparency and community participation in, in smart cities. And the final one about uh, safeguarding public trust um, in, in digital systems by putting cybersecurity, um, um, uh, putting in place cybersecurity uh, measures. So that then starts defining what is meant by the people centered smart city uh, approach. Um, and then the other thing that is, I mean, there are a few other things in here as well, and I encourage you to have a, to have a look at it. But uh, another key thing is asks uh, UN Habitat to convene a global consultative process to develop international guidelines on people-centered smart cities. Um, those, uh, that consultative process uh, needs to, to bring in uh, all sorts of different stakeholders, of course, member states, local governments, local government associations, civil society, academia, private sector, UN agencies, uh, etc. And, and we're just now, I mean, the resolution was approved on Friday, but we are right now at UN Habitat discussing how how we will um, uh, put in place this, uh, this this process to make it as as effective um, and consultative as, as possible. Uh, we have two years uh, to do it. The resolution um, has requests us to present uh, the the international guidelines for adoption uh, at the next or continued session of the UN Habitat Assembly, which will be in 2025. The idea behind these international guidelines is that they can guide different stakeholders, but primarily, I would say, member states and um, local governments on how they can put in place uh, their own plans, smart city strategies and smart city uh, regulations. So we see this as a really key uh, normative document uh, for the world uh, beyond 2025. And of course, uh, it needs to be technically sound. Uh, it needs to be appropriate for different types of, of um, um, of, of countries, uh, different situations, and 
um, and so on. And we want it, of course, to be as useful as, as possible. Thank you, Pontus. Um, I think it's very clear from what we heard that from in various resolutions that UN Habitat is really trying to, you know, put forward again pragmatic tools uh, for both states but also other stakeholders, including local and regional governments. Here you're talking about normative, you know, a normative tool guidelines in the case um, of uh, what Esteban referred earlier, it was an operational framework. We're talking about toolkits. So it's all instruments that basically can be used by cities, by states to make sure that their cities are more resilient, you know, more um, basically resilient to urban crisis, to climate change, that they, they transform digitally in, in a sustainable manner. And that's very much welcome. Um, don't forget, Geneva organizations, when you organize a consultation, Pontus, uh, there are quite a number of them that would be relevant, I think, uh, in, in, in relation to your mandate. Um, can I ask uh, people online, there are quite a few of them, if they have questions. I understand that there's a first question um, that has been raised about uh, the participation of private people and architects in working group. So I was looking at the resolution, I'm not sure who asked the question about which basically working group but we've mentioned housing and sorry i'm trying to read uh okay so i think it all depends on the terms of reference that are to be adopted by those working group for instance in the case of the working group on adequate housing for all i think it's it's written intergovernmental working group then it doesn't mean that other experts cannot contribute to that for instance, if they are invited by the working group or, you know, if there's a call for contributions. I was also looking at the um, at the working group for biodiversity, sorry, uh, biodiversity and resilient cities. It's called an open ended international expert advisory group. And here it does mention experts already engaged with the concept of, of biodiverse and resilient cities. So just to respond to your question really, it, it depends really, you know, what's the mandate, um, who are to be the members of those working group, and it's really a case by case, um, it's a case by case basis. Um, are there any other questions? I see a hand, oh yes, yeah, sorry. Um, who has the responsibility of setting up the working group, the government ministries of the member states, or who? So, can I turn yeah. to you, <laughs> Graham? And, and basically, there's a, a little process to go through beforehand. The terms of reference of those working groups have to be worked out first of all, which will be done by the Secretariat presented to the subsidiary governing bodies. Um, and that will determine how we approach and how we invite. But I mean, that doesn't, um, that doesn't stop uh, anybody who's interested uh, in, in contacting us and offering their support. I mean, We've always been, as a UN agency, very open and very participatory. Uh, as you've seen, you've heard the various presenters. Uh, our governing body meeting always has, albeit in the margins, uh, substantive expertise drawn from across the globe at our meetings. That's not going to change. In fact, anything, it's going to get more. Mm. So if anybody is interested in um, contributing to our work, no reasonable offer of help is refused. So please please contact us but there will be a process to go through first to organize the terms of reference of course being an agency we have to be fair and we have to be, show impartiality so we will make sure that that process is done in a, in a transparent and open way but, uh, there's every opportunity if you have uh, something to offer and give and support us we welcome that very much Thank you, Graham. I think there's another question about will local communities be involved in all resolution? What will be their roles and responsibilities? Somehow, I think I've responded to this earlier. It's, it's a bit of a case by case basis. I think you would need to look at what is the topic that you prioritize, basically, and how you can contribute it. So um, Pontus referred earlier to consultations, you know, that will take place on the guidelines for people-centered smart cities. So somehow, you know, um, please reach out to UN Habitat if you want to be part of those consultations and send, for instance, a contribution to, to, to those guidelines or any other tool that UN Habitat is preparing. For instance, the, the public platforms, you know, that will summarize the best practices, policies, existing tools out there. I think 
everyone will be somehow invited to contribute to those platforms to make sure that, you know, they are useful for people who have no idea or little idea or other idea about biodiverse and resilient cities and what they can learn from, from, from one each other. Yeah, maybe I can say something to this as well and to, I mean, for us, um, local authorities, local governments, of course, are in this unique position. On the one hand, they're there to implement national government policy, but they're also there to maximise the participation and engagement of the communities that they serve. And we're seeing so many local authorities around the world who are opening up platforms to allow uh, participation of citizens in decision-making process and devolving some of that responsibility to groups. This is absolutely the way things are going to go. Uh, it means efficient use of resources. It means the managers and the leaders of local governments are ones who know their communities best and who understand uh, what the best solutions are and how they're going to work. Um, so, I mean, there's every opportunity for civil society organisations, specialist groups, those representing vulnerable groups as well, uh, to have an input into this decision making process and it can find its way uh, into the tools and approaches. If there are good practices around the world that um, we, you know, we can use uh, and, and even transfer across regions and continents, this is another place where um, you know, communities and good practices can, can be involved and absorbed into the process and shared with others. So I think there's huge opportunities. I mean, you know, from, from my work over 30 years in Habitat, I've seen this uh, as, a, as a progressive engagement um, and uh, it it's only it comes with good outcomes. So I think there's every opportunity to engage. Thanks, uh, Graham. Another question about engagement. Uh, from Caroline, uh, from the Council of Governors, with re in relation to the people-centered smart cities. And unfortunately, Pontus has left, but I'll try to give a go. What would be the role of offices in public service in the devolved or local government in ensuring the success of implementation of the resolution? I think the first thing that you can do is to be aware <laughs> about the existence of the resolution hopefully about you know the existence of the guidelines that will come a bit later um, in two years as Pontus has said and I think your role is really basically to be aware of its content try to apply it you know if it makes sense in your local context to apply it at local level and also to hold your own government your national government accountable to that saying that basically you were part of the assembly deciding upon this resolution on people-centered smart cities. Basically, these are, you know, what, what, these are the different criteria that make a city people-centered and smart. And therefore, hold your national government accountable to that by using those resolutions as, as advocacy tool somehow. So I hope I have responded to your question. Um, are there any other questions? No? All right, let me quickly turn to, you know, we're not going to touch upon all the 10 resolutions, but I just wanted to mention them. So at least you have an idea about what were the other um, issues that were discussed. We have a resolution about the World Cleanup Day, um, and it's basically simply a resolution that calls upon people to, to celebrate, to commemorate the World Cleanup Day on the 20 something of September, if I remember correctly. Um, it does not have any, you know, operational action directly, but just for you to be aware that this has been adopted. Uh, we also have another resolution about the localization of the SDGs, um, and that was basically referred to by the mayor of Kitchener earlier. And it's really, it's really asking UN Habitat to promote the localization and to support the localization of SDGs by local and regional government, by developing normative guidance, by building the capacity of local and regional governments to report on those SDGs through what we call VLRs or voluntary local reviews. Um, that was another resolution. And we have three more resolution, one on the interlinkages between urbanization and climate change. And I think it's fairly now obvious to everyone that there are linkages when it comes to the impact of climate change 
um, in urban centers and what can be done in order to make sure that UN Habitat um, you know, devolves attention to that important topic that will become more and more important. Um, and we have another resolution about urban planning and sustainable ur infrastructure. Again, asking Habitat to create a global digital platform for urbanization and infrastructure that serves as a resource to both states, to both local and regional governments in order to make sure that when you, you, know, when you plan, you make sure that your infrastructure is as sustainable as possible. And the last one, um, and it's not the least important, I would say, it's been again mentioned several times by several speakers, is a resolution asking, you know, asking states and other actors to provide financing for the implementation of those resolutions and to monitor basically those resolutions. Because if you have, you know, hundreds of hundreds of new mandates but no money basically to implement them, then you know they just remain lettre morte in French, we would say. So I think that point was nicely basically um, re or emphasized in the ministerial declaration. Um, really asking states to walk the talk and to finance basically um, all those new things we are asking new or you know uh, things we are asking to UN Habitat to, to, to do. Um, there's another question there. Many of these resolution overlap. Mm -hmm. So will there be coordination of these resolutions? Who takes the lead in UN Habitat? Well, maybe I can attempt to answer that question. I mean, we, 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 have, we have specialists in-house to deal with all of the, the resolutions that come up. You're absolutely right. They are, uh, many of them are inextricably linked. But the important thing about the resolutions is that they provide a focus for other uh, related areas. I'll give you an example. Um, the, the, the resolution on biodiversity um, and resilient cities will also have an element of One Health in it, for example. We know from the COVID um, outbreak that, you know, the importance of understanding how humans interact with the natural environment and the animal environment is going to be very important uh, as we move forward and how we develop resilience against, uh, heaven forbid, uh, pandemics like before. So, the, you know, there's, there's lots within those, uh, uh, those um, resolutions that if you expand slightly, they bring in a whole load of other areas. The localization is another good example. Um, you find often that uh, at the national level, the SDGs, the figures don't show the inequities that exist at subnational level. The localization of the SDGs at local level, you know, using the VLRs, will show the differences between what's happening in some cities within a country and the national average. So it's very important, this idea of using that data for advocacy. Um, of course, the housing uh, and the slum uh, uh, resolutions are, are also intimately linked. And one other very important thing about these resolutions, and, and quite often people forget, that 60% of the urban areas that will exist in 2050 have yet to be built, okay? This is such an important thing, and this is where the local authorities and regional governments come in, because they're the ones who hold the, the keys, if you like, or the tools to ensure that the planning of the future urban settlements goes in the right direction. That we try and minimize, uh, we improve the quality of life for urban dwellers by minimizing those who have to live in slums. So th this, the relationship between us, as the questioner asked, it's very important that we understand how these, uh, the, these resolutions fit together. The other very important thing about the resolutions is that they call, uh, they call for us to report back at the next assembly. Yes. So this is very much, very, very important because we need to monitor the change. I mean, this is why we do the, you know, the, the VLRs and other things. But it's very important that in those resolutions, we have to report back on the status. So, uh, you know, we need to see the progress as we're moving forward. We know, unfortunately, the slum target, uh, you know, things aren't so much better. But it's very, very important that we, we monitor this.
Thanks, Hugh Graham. There's another question. I'm not sure I understand the, the thrust of the question, but just reading it now. Just wondering if there's a working group task to analyze the problem of member states when it comes to habitat or DRRM, disaster risk management, I would guess, yeah. guess, rather than showing models or good examples. If there's one, is, it, is there a possibility in, to join the group? Um, so I'm not sure what, are well, you able to answer? I mean, Brent? please reach out to us if you have any particular uh, interest in, in being involved in this work. We're always happy to hear from you. Um, I think, yes, there are many good examples. I mean, one of the interesting things about our work is that we do learn of many good practices uh, around the world, which sometimes don't have uh, enough exposure. And we can facilitate uh, the communication of those ideas to uh, other cities within the same country, to other cities in the region, or even uh, across continents. So um, yes, there are very many potential opportunities to get involved. Thank you, Graham. Just to uh, mention that we will, you know, draft a small report about this event and use what we, how we call them, this is how we call them here at the Universities Hub, and we'll provide all the references and probably all the resolutions, but they're available on the website of the Habitat Assembly. Um, I wanted to give them, sorry, there's another question from Ghana Accra. Uh, I would like to know a bit about the resolution of urban planning and infrastructure. All right, let me go to my note then. <laughs> all right, they, they, so I mentioned there was a, a resolution about urban planning and sustainable infrastructure, which basically really acknowledged the, the many fold urban challenges being increasing Populate, urban population, urban sprawl, traffic congestion, environmental degradation, water shortages, increased inequality. So that's the frame in which the resolution, the frame that the resolution offers. And um, in order to somehow respond to that, and I think I've mentioned it, uh, the resolution requests UN Habitat to develop a global digital platform for urbanization and infrastructure. Mm -hmm that serves as a resource for fle of flexible and, and adaptable tools for urban planning and sustainable infrastructure. And the platform would really provide, you know, examples of different policy initiatives, tools, good practices, solution for integrated urban and infrastructure planning, mechanism for capacity building, both at national and I think at local level. And it also calls on all stakeholders, including local and regional governments, to share those best practices. I've mentioned it earlier, but that's the way that basically everyone can get involved um, in order to yeah. make those digital platform as useful as possible um, and to present what you think is a solution in your context and that can be replicable to other contexts. Yeah, no, I'm just going to say that, you know, so much of the focus of UN Habitat's work on urban planning has been about participatory planning. And we have several examples of projects and programs and indeed tools that we've got which facilitate um, you know, communities and groups to become involved in planning at the local level. So uh, if you go to our website, you can find some good examples there. You know, we've got uh, examples of like using the Minecraft uh, game, computer games to encourage young people to get involved in the planning of their city. We've got um, the, um, what is it called? The She Tools um, City, which involves uh, women's participation in planning processes. So this is what this is all about. This, this resolution is about opening up the planning process to local communities and partners to ensure that we, and I mean, you know, that, that, that is particularly important when it comes to um, the, the low income settlements, um, because there are progressive changes that you can bring about in, um, in low income settlements and slums, where, you know, the community have a huge input into planning uh, the level of access to infrastructure that they want, uh, the type of access, you know, these sorts of things. So yes, it's um, it's a it's a very very important resolution, um, but it's it's there to embellish and build on a lot of what Habitat um, already does in terms of developing these participatory tools. I think Tijani from Accra is asking the question: How do we do we take part in this global platform? And I mean. 
It's been adopted last week at the Habitat Assembly. You need to leave Habitat a bit of time to basically develop this global platform uh, before basically, you know, being able to take part in it. I think it's only fair <laughs> to accord them a little bit of time <laughs> before the global platform is, is actually established and really the resolution is implemented. But we're very delighted that you have the passion that you want to join. <laughs> so please, no, no good offer of help is refused. So please make sure you contact us. All right, I've got one hand raised uh, there, Ambassador Professor Muharrem Shabani, please. Two of them. You have the floor, if you can talk. You have the floor, Ambassador. Uh, I can't see you, I can't hear you. You muted. No, all right. Let's go to the next hand raise, Abdul Hani, sorry, Oyalo if I can read correctly. You have the floor as well. Can you switch on your camera and unmute yourself? Oh, oh yeah. Oh. You have the floor. Yeah, where can, uh, is my camera on now? No, but we hear you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Please introduce uh, yourself. Yeah, you can, okay, you can hear me, right? Yes. Did you, sorry. Uh, you particularly asked me a question on, uh, you just said I should introduce myself. Yes, please introduce yourself before asking your question or making your comment. Okay, so uh, I'm Mr. Yaifu Abdukani from International Society for Peace and Safety, an organization based in Nigeria. And uh, we have uh, UN uh, Echoes of uh, Status, so I have to be part of this program because uh, I was trying to see if I can appear in person, but when I see the opportunity of all and I said, okay, let me join so that I can list here and learn a few things from the UN habitats. Thank you. I'm not sure I got your point, but the question was whether you could participate to the habitat assembly itself, but I think it was last week. And it's over now. So, um, but I guess if you have the ECOSOC status, normally you should be able to participate. And sorry if I haven't understood your question correctly. Uh, let's go to Ambassador Shabani, if you know. All right. I think, oh, there's a, there's a long question there. Yeah. Um, okay. Hello. Thank you for providing. I'm curious about how these resolutions will be implemented in developing and lead developed countries, considering the significant lack in achievement other international agreements, such as the SDGs, Paris Agreement, and the Sendai Framework. On the other hand, some regions like the EU have made substantial progress in meeting these targets. Could you please elaborate on how you plan to address this practical aspect? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that's a very good question and it's been somehow taken care of in the resolutions. Uh, if, you read them very, if you read them very carefully, very often there will be a focus on developing countries and that's very much the role of UN Habitat as well, to help you know, developing countries build capacity to reach those basically, to implement those resolution, to reach the SDGs. Um, and therefore, you know, it's, when states were negotiated, negotiating the resolution, I can assure you that um, a lot of them from the developing countries were making their voice heard about this aspect. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're reaching to the end of our event. I hope um, this was somehow useful to you to understand, you know, what was discussed there, what were the topic discussed, and what are the resolutions about, and how they will be implemented by UN Habitat to serve both states, but also local and regional governments, and many other actors that work in all those different topics. There will be many other opportunities for local and regional governments to engage in relation to all those issues, including um, one which is upcoming and very close. It's going to be the high level political mm -hmm. forum, HLPF, where the sustainable development goal number 11, that is basically dedicating to making cities and human settlements sustainable, resilient, safe, and I don't remember all the qualifiers. Uh, so SDG 11 will be reviewed at this upcoming high level political forum in New York in July. And therefore they will, you know, be focused discussion 
on that. Um, we'll have the SDG Summit, it's September again in New York to review the progress or the lack of progress in relation to the realization of SDGs and what is needed now to basically reach those goals. And many other, um, many other meetings, um, a little bit, um, a little bit further away, including the World Urban Forum uh, in November 2024 in Cairo. And then we mention it, the third Habitat Assembly, which will only be held in 2029. So I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank all colleagues from UN Habitat and in particular Graham, who is here with us today. Any, of the, any closing remarks? Um, I, basically, I mean, delighted to be here with all of you this afternoon uh, here with, with Geneva Cities Hub. I think, you know, the mandates uh, have always been there of a need for us to focus on, uh, of course, housing, uh, particularly for, for the poor. We now have uh, climate, we now unfortunately have conflicts as well in many parts of the world. The mandate of UN Habitat has become even more important as we move forward and will so in the coming years. We still have a long way to go to convince people of the importance of um, the work on urbanization and how it's going to impact us. And I think, you know, if you look at the uh, examples of the recent COVID pandemic and of course the extremes in climate we're seeing, um, we didn't really foresee that those uh, events were going to happen. Um, we are also at risk uh, if we don't take the issue of urbanization seriously, because it will impact on all aspects of our life. The great thing is that there are many opportunities to engage on this issue. Uh, the UN Habitat Assembly was one, but as Antu was saying, there is a whole roadmap, if you like, of events and opportunities for us to discuss about these issues in more detail and to uh, share with you um, our experience and to learn from you uh, in the cities and the governments of, of, of how we can support this. Um, we do, uh, of course, uh, have, as I said, the importance of uh, monitoring these resolutions, understanding how we're achieving it, but also understanding how we're achieving it at the sub-national level. And this is something which is very important for us. And that's the reason why we need to uh, work so closely with um, local and regional governments, because the devil in some cases is, is, is in the detail and we do need to understand what's happening in some areas. But um, we're very open, we're a very participatory uh, agency, we encourage participatory approaches and uh, that will follow through in the implementation of our resolutions. Um, and we look forward to uh, supporting you as best we can and please keep in contact with us and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much for following the event. See you soon.